Hi, everyone. My name is Paige Doherty. Welcome back to Seed to Harvest, a podcast all about incredible venture capitalists and their journeys. I'm really excited to be here today with Matt Conwell, the founding partner of Rare Breed Ventures and an enthusiastic drag racer. Is that right? That is <laughs> um, correct. I'm really excited to share a bit of Mac's story and have a conversation around frameworks, around how he spends his time and how he makes investment decisions and also his North Star. So I think I would love to start off honestly with what is your North Star, Mac? So my North Star is this amazing woman, a black woman here in Baltimore, running a company called MeatSpundle.com. And really why she's my North Star is because I watched this woman for three years trying to convince people that her idea of a tumble dryer that could dry a wig or hair extension in 15 minutes with no heat was a valuable idea and watched her get nothing but no's to the point where her she determined that her only option in order to get access to capital to start building her first prototype was by becoming a surrogate mother. Gave birth to twins to raise a nominal amount of money just so she could start building a prototype. And to watch her go through that experience was truly frustrating for me, especially considering when you look at the way the hair extension market, which is projected to be a $10 billion market by the year 2023, with zero innovation in the care for the products, what she was building was like a true opportunity. And nobody else could see that. And that was frustrating. I think that's such an incredibly powerful story of what motivates you as an investor. I would love to dig deeper also into your personal motivation. I think we have some interesting crossovers. We both previously had security clearances and worked at Northrop Grumman before forging into the investing world. I would love to hear what specifically did you take from that experience that you now apply as an investor? I mean, I don't like from that experience, the thing I take with, you know, I'm an engineer. So I've been an engineer and I've had a position where I was being known back when I worked at North of Roman and Bulls Allen Hamilton as somebody who would just take on any project, you know, when there was a project no, that nobody else would want to take, I would take it. Right. And so uh, I became like a fixer or a problem solver. So I was always tinkering with a bunch of different things. It was never one thing. And so that feeds into being an entrepreneur and tinkering and trying to solve random problems. And then as an investor, I basically get the work, you know, in the peripheral of, you know, dozens of companies, you know, solving complex problems all the time. So I guess it just feeds into my, my ADD-ness, yeah. always wanting to do something different, right? Um, yeah. And I yeah. love that sense of being peripheral to engineers. I definitely share a similar interest in terms of like having that engineer at heart and then applying it to investing. So I'm curious, as you think about that transition i believe that congratulations are in order as you have closed your first fund yes we have closed yes. one one the rare breed we can celebrate uh, all the flowers i'm so happy for you mac it's been such an incredible year two years to year, be on yeah. this journey together yeah so i would love to hear more about like your experience fundraising and maybe some of the fun and not so fun stories that came out of that fundraising is hard you know, everybody talks about how hard it is. And then you start doing it and you realize that it is like as hard, if not harder than what everybody <laughs> says. Fundraising for me was interesting in the fact of early on in the fundraising process, I recognized I didn't have a network of LPs. Mm -hmm. And so my way to grow that network was through my Twitter presence. I noticed that the more I tweeted about venture and entrepreneurship, the more other VCs would follow me. And so I just made it a point that if I saw there was a VC who followed me, I would send them a message to have a meeting. And so. I had a lot of meetings in a short amount of time, but it did two things or did three things. One, it helped grow my profile and brand because now I had a larger group of people who knew me. Two, it helped me learn like how to fundraise and from other GPs and get advice. But then three, and the one that I wasn't expecting, but was most important was a lot of these GPs and other funds started committing capital to my fund. And so like the first two to three million in my fund, which is a $10 million fund, all came from, the majority came from other GPs, other funds, mm. right? And so like the Twitter thing became my strategy. And then also on top of that, I can credit 
Angelus for this for making because when Angelus last year came out or in twenty twenty came out with their rolling funds and you know those things started to get popular. One of the really interesting parts about rolling funds was they could, they were able to publicly solicit. And so my Twitter presence is growing. I'm like, oh, the ability to public solicit would be a game changer for me. I got to do this. And really what it was, they were taking the advantage of a designation that most funds had, a 506C. The 506C designation actually comes from the Jobs Act from back in 2013, which allows for both funds and companies to raise capital in a public manner, but all their investors must be accredited. Well, I was always, I was always only going to have accredited investors in my fund to begin with. So mm -hmm. for me, that gave me a clear option to talk about my fund publicly. And now I'm part of a wave that you, I would say, are part of as well of these emerging funds that are, built, are doing what we call building in public, where we're keeping people involved and letting people know what we're doing at every step of the way in a very transparent way, which, you know, is really cool and is allowing a lot of people to see how the industry works, but also puts you in a very vulnerable place, right? Like everybody's mm -hmm. there for you when you do well, but if you do bad, it all happens in public too, which is, <laughs> yep. you know, a very interesting place to be. So I want to ask you, Paige, what's that been like for you, building in public? How's building in public been for you? Yeah, building in public's been super interesting. I think that we've had a bit of divergent routes because we chose to raise under 506B, which means you can't solicit and you can't publicly right. talk about fundraising. I struggled with that because there's this gray area where the SEC is not really going to come after you if you have like a tiny, <laughs> like $5 million nano fund. But there is some sense of, you know, later on when we go to do institutional due diligence on future funds, how that reflects on our integrity as fund managers and not complying with those regulations. And so for me, it was an interesting walking the line of how can I add value to the community that I built while staying compliant. So definitely for the next one, we're going to do 506C so I can talk about it. But I, I think that I've been so excited to see you and the folks at Overlooked especially have just done an incredible job of bringing the community into your fundraising process and talking about how difficult it is. There was a great quote from Harry Stubbings' podcast about, he said, everyone everyone talks about how f hard fundraising is and says it's the hardest thing they've ever done. And then you actually start doing it and you're like, oh, wow, shit. This is definitely the hardest thing that I've ever done. I think that's the one thing I wish I could have shared more of is it is a very difficult journey, but it's sometimes like you have to laugh at it. Like getting your first million dollar no is such a surreal, <laughs> surreal experience. I would love for you to talk about maybe some of the the no's that you got that ultimately ended up you know you reflected on them in a positive way looking back now there's nothing positive about getting the no what are you talking about <laughs> it's no just not yet <laughs> no suck um i mean it's it's interesting like because i had so many meetings in a short amount of time like for context mm -hmm. from june of 2020 to september of 2020 i had over 1100 meetings right and from like June 2020 to June of 2021, I had close to 4,000 meetings. So I just had a bunch of meetings, right? Mm -hmm. And so I never went into them thinking about money as I was about learning and making connections if the money hadn't great. And so when people would pass, I'd be like, well, I, I never asked for it anyway, so thanks. It's cool. <laughs> but, you know, there were a few toward, but like as I got closer to the end of the fund and the momentum was picking up, I started getting more and more institutions who were interested. And I did mm -hmm. have some institutions pass. For one reason or another, you know, cause like my fundraise is very untraditional. My fund structure is untraditional. I don't have a GP commit, which, you know, other GPs can be mad at me about. I'm sorry. I just, I'm broke. I couldn't do it. You know, I had a fund policy because I didn't have a GP commit, mm -hmm. right? They're like, yeah, we just, we can't get there. And I was like, all right, you're lost. Like, I mean, if you can't get over the fact that I don't have the money to be able to put in my own capital into this fund and you think that's going to stop me from doing everything humanly possible. Like the whole point of putting in a GP commit is just so that they can feel like you have skin in the game. So like, they feel like you're going to be as attached to this fund as they are. It's like, no, this is my career. Like, like yeah. if, like if this fund doesn't work, like I'm out of work essentially. So <laughs> I'm going to do everything I can, whether I put money in this or not, like it's not going to be the determinant about how hard I work. But if you don't agree with that, then that's fine. Right. And so, you know, I've had LPs pass for that and you know, my track record's not as long, so I've had LPs pass for that. I probably have had LPs pass because I'm 
big black and with dreadlocks. I don't know. I can only <laughs> surmise, right? But I will say, you know, we all have these moments of fundraising. So fundraising is really hard. But as you go, you have these moments where like you get on the winning streak, where like every meeting you have, you're closing and then you're winning and you're feeling good. And you're like, oh, this place will be cool. It's no time. And then all of a sudden you get a no <laughs> that you weren't expecting or a string of no's. And it just kind of resets you. It's just like, oh yeah, this is really hard. Everybody's not going to give me their money. Not everybody's going to think I'm that smart. Okay. Let's, let's get back to the basics. <laughs> Those are always the, the like, the moments where you're like tested. But then again, you know, for me, it was similar to being an entrepreneur. Like I was used to that. But I will say, you know, I've had talks with other fund managers where like those moments come up. It's like, dang, I wasn't prepared for that. No, <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta reset myself and like take a day and get ready, get back up on the horse and go back at it. Oh yeah. yeah. That like regulation of your, I, I refer to it as an emotional thermostat, but how you stay regulated during such an incredibly roller coaster style of emotions. I'm curious how that has changed. I remember watching this video when we first started raising and someone committed to a $10,000 investment and I took a video and I was crying in it because I was so happy. And then I got further and further into fundraising and then it would be like, oh, cool. Like we got like a hundred thousand dollar commitment, like cool, <laughs> you know? Um, so I'm curious like how you've thought about regulating your emotional thermostat as you've gone through the fundraising process. I don't know if I've thought about it too much because like, again, I should say like raising a fund as a fund manager is the most entrepreneurial thing we can do. Mm -hmm. And having had two startups before, it just all looked really familiar. And then I realized like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm building a company from scratch again. I said, I would never do this. This is awesome. <laughs> and so it's just more the regulation of you enjoy the wins and you don't, and you try not to beat yourself up for the losers. Right. But I will say, you know, there's been several times where I've gotten the call and people have committed and I'm like on run around in my backyard screaming and yelling, like, I can't believe it. We did this. You know, the first time somebody committed a dollar to my fund, the first time I got the a hundred thousand dollar check, shout out to Scott Telsky. The first time I got, you know, a five hundred thousand dollar check, which turned into a million check. Shout out Insight Partners, right? Like all of those were seminal moments for me to let me know, like, oh, I, like, like this is possible. But then, you know, when you get the no's or you get turned down or when you have a meeting, like everything's going great. And then there's some technicality that comes up later, or there's some due diligence thing that you're like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing this. 20 page due diligence package y'all y'all can keep your money kind of a thing those things are deflating like you know I, i've gone through that grind before mm -hmm. and so you know it's just i you know take an evening watch a watch a basketball game watch a football game have an old-fashioned and go back to it tomorrow right like yeah you just you internalize it, you let it go. go to <laughs> buffalo wild wings with your friends and then about it and then you know you go back to it so that's really you know everybody's got to find their own way to kind of de-stress and let that stuff go and you just can't dwell on it. When I was an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. I used to dwell on that stuff. And it was so unhealthy. Yeah. It's you just like, it's hard learning how to take things like less seriously while appreciating the privilege that you have for being in the position that you're in for sure. I'm curious, you mentioned earlier that your fund structure is different. I would love if you could expand on that. Maybe some aspects of your portfolio construction or thesis that you want to touch on. Yeah. So I should say. It's not really the structure, like my basic structure of my fund is fairly standard. It's more about mm -hmm. the process that we put in place for fundraising was really abnormal. And the fact of what I did was I saw rolling funds that, that you know, Angels was doing. I thought they were really cool, but I didn't like the way they did the LP returns. Right? Mm -hmm. And so what I recognized was all the things I liked about rolling funds were like technological and all the things I hated was structural. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, if I just use the standard structure, can I do everything else to say? The answer was pretty much yes, right? So, you know, 506C, public solicit, work with Carta as our back, as our back office. They had a partnership at the time with a company called Annual Transactions, which turns your, your sub docs, and LPA, and any other legal docs into a guided web form, which is awesome because all I got to do is send people links and they can get access to my docs. And so mm -hmm. we have it set up on our website. If you click, a, you can go to rarebreed.vc and click a button to become an LP. Tell us you're accredited and you would just automatically get access to our sub docs. Like you ain't, you ain't got to talk to me. You ain't got to worry about the lawyer. Like you just go straight there. And then we do rolling closes every three weeks. So as LPs commit, 
we would send them to Carta in batches. And every three weeks we would close on a group of LPs, which allowed us to get capital as we were going. So we were able to deploy a lot more capital than we would have had we gone through like a traditional closed structure. Or, and, even, and even for our capital calls, we didn't use a traditional capital call structure. You know, most people call capital as looted. We call capital, we gave our, our, our LPs three options for capital. They could do 100% upfront, 50% over two years, or 33% each year for three years, with the minimum being 10K per year. So our minimum was 10K originally. So if you wanted to make a 10K investment, you had to do it all up front, right? Um, and I got the idea for that from 500 Startups Fund 1, where they made all their LPs put 50% up front and 25% each year over the next two years, right? Which kind of runs almost like a subscription, which is similar, which is like rolling fund is like people subscribe for quarters. So we basically gave people the ability to subscribe for years. Like you're going to do it over one year, two year, or three years. And that worked out for my LPs. Like they were perfectly happy with it. Like I haven't had a single LP yet. I didn't know how I considered about it, which also reminded me that like all the things they tell you that you're supposed to do in Vitri, like you don't have to follow any rules. Like there, there aren't really rules here, right? Like there are just, there are structures and processes that have worked in the past for others. And they've just shared it enough where that became the prevailing thought, but doesn't have to be the only one. Mm -hmm. And so like, those are the kind of things that we did differently, but you know, in the, the back end structure, you know, there's a, a management company, a GP and an LP, right? Like, you know, all that stuff is, it's kind of standard. And you know, for our fund, we needed to have, like, we were doing enough things on the front end that were weird that we had to have some <laughs> stuff that were standard on. Cause like LPs yeah. don't want things that are too crazy, too out of the ordinary. Yeah. You don't want like half your pitch to be explaining like some weird aspect of your like back end. Yeah. It's like that's. That's not helpful, but also <laughs> that's one of the reasons why I did some of those long form posts that I did. So like mm -hmm. I did a post about we're not, we're not doing a rolling fund, but this is what we're doing. And L I didn't know there were LPs who invest in our fund who read that first. Right. And so now that gives them a framework of, oh, he's doing something different. So when they come into the meeting, they're already expecting to hear about me doing something different versus me having to like explain it as much to them. Like they're more excited to learn how I'm different than it is like being scary for them, which, you know, that was a big bit of. Absolutely. I think the whole building in public when you're working through things that can really only be explained in long form documents is really helpful because some of those things take so long to explain when you atomize the different structures on the back end of venture and are putting them back together in a structure that works better for, you know, the modern the next generation of fund managers, in, in my opinion, will choose to atomize the structures and use them like little Lego blocks and put them in all sorts of different formations. Uh, so, you know, you've talked to an incredible number of funds and GPs. I'm curious what firms you look up to or have taken pieces either from portfolio construction, how they do their investment process, or just how they're established as a brand that you've admired or taking a little Lego piece of? Well, I'm a huge fan of the folks at Hustle Fund. I think Hustle Fund is an amazing brand. It's an amazing team. They do a really good job of supporting entrepreneurs in, in a very tangible way. Like I've been able to see it with some of our co-investors up front that I love those folks. Um, I'm, I'm a big, I mean, everybody's a fan of Andreessen and folks like that, the Encompass, the Sequoias, the First Rounds. They're all a little different, but, you know, to become a top tier fund like that, that's the goal. But when I think about my fund construction, my fund construction is probably closest line to precursor, you know, mm -hmm. and, and Charles Hudson was like one of the first to really double down on this idea of pre-seed. What is pre-seed? You know, basically doing like 20 investments a year, you know, this larger portfolio, not as many board seats, really being supportive and helpful for their founders. You know, I love the work that, you know, Charles has done over there. And then, you know, when I start thinking about the firm I want to build out over time, my real, the, the firms I truly look up to are any Green Spring Associates. And that's really particular because, you know, being based in Baltimore, many people might not know this, but two of the founders of NEA are from Baltimore. It's originally a Maryland-based firm and Green Spring Associates, which is a Maryland-based firm, 
one of the founders is the son of one of the founders of NEA, right? Like there's that kind of thing. And so those are the folks that I, as I was breaking into the tech ecosystem that I heard about and got to meet first, right? Those are the folks who have been my mentors, my advisors. Folks I run into at bars and get to talk deals with, and they're both amazing firms. I mean, Greenspring Associates recently got acquired by Steps, which is an amazing deal. It's like a $750 million deal kind of thing. Mm -hmm. NEA is a top tier fund up there with the Sequoias and the, the Andreessons of the world. And so to have folks from that ilk who support me and some who are LPs in the fund and some who are mentors and advisors to me means the world. And so, you know, I'm going to build the next large multi-stage firm based out of Baltimore. When people look at me crazy, when I say that, I'm like, well, we already had two. I'm just <laughs> the next generation in that line. And, uh, and as I think about, you know, I close my fund one and I'm looking at my fund two, my fund two is going to have a lot more elements of like a green spring associates, mm -hmm. which, you know, hopefully it'll be a lot more to come on that end in the near future. Oh, I'm excited for that. I think that that's such an incredible vision, and I have no doubt that you are the right person to carry it out. I'm wishing you all the success in that. Uh, so in terms of your investment style, why do founders choose to work with you, in your own words? Founders choose to work with me because I tell them up front that they should treat me like an employee. Like, I'm not always going to be the biggest check. I'm going to be a meaningful one. And whatever you need help with, like, yeah, we do the VC help of, you know, I can pick up the phone and call a, an operator or try to find you, you know, a, a rock star employee or, you know, help you, from, you know, put a round together. But like, you got my cell phone number. Call me, text me for anything, mm -hmm. right? Like, yo, Mac, I need help just figuring out payroll. Okay, let's figure out payroll. Me and my co-founder had a big fight last night. Okay, let's talk about it. Hey, I got, I, I had this meeting with this VC. What does this mean? What do they say to me? Oh, well, let's sit down and have a conversation. Hey, I got an angel investor who's getting on my nerves. What do I do? Well, let's talk about it. Should I do React Native or should I build a native app? Well, no, let's have a call. Like, talk like you can use me for anything, right? We had one entrepreneur who, you know, she raised some money and, you know, she needed to put a team together and do some hiring and she was struggling with finding some people. And so basically me and some of my teammates basically worked with her, worked for her for basically a week and a half and helped to do some hiring, set up her payroll and everything else, right? So that she could focus on what she needed to focus. I don't know many funds that are going to do stuff like that, right? And so I think that's why entrepreneurs work with me. And some of them want to work with me just because they see the Twitter thing and they think I'm really cool. So like, I'll take that too. <laughs> I love that. I think I, I really admire that about you and Rare Breed, that you're really willing to go to work and go to bat for the founders that you support. I would love to talk about some of your recent deals. I know one just got announced early bird. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you found that deal and, and why you're excited about it? Early bird is an amazing one that just got announced today, which is awesome. Alongside, you know, 776, so Alexis O'Hanian and then Gemini. I think that's the third largest crypto wallet out there, the Winklevoss twins, which is kind of odd. Like that, those are like some names. I don't know if I'm, I'm supposed to be, you know, in the same breath, of, but I'll take it. Right. Oh, for sure. For sure. You better say that with your chest, Mac. <laughs> but early bird is amazing because here's one of the secrets to getting into some of these really cool deals is I build relationships, not just with other GPs, but with a lot of young people just breaking into venture. A lot of people who are just recently breaking into venture mm -hmm. and are just looking for somebody to talk to or, or talk about ideas or how you it work in this industry. And so that actually came from a, a, a woman who I met, who's working at another farm as a senior associate. And when she saw the deal, she brought it to me and I thought it was amazing, right? I, I've gotten so many deals that way from you know, the associates that people always tell you, you shouldn't spend time with, or you shouldn't talk to <laughs> like, no, if you find an associate, a firm with things, what you're building is really cool. They will be your biggest advocate. Mm -hmm. Right. And even if their firm doesn't do it, doesn't mean they can't get you to a firm that does. Yeah. And so especially, I'll like enough. especially when they can't push through a deal, they're really passionate about to a partner meeting. I think folks find particular joy in 
finding a partner that believes in it as much as they do. A hundred percent. And so that, that's how that, that, that deal came through. And I mean, got to meet Jordan and Caleb and amazing team, amazing founders, amazing vision. And, you know, it's a, it's a cool product because, you know, it allows you to make investments on behalf of the young people in your life, the children in your life. Well, I'm somebody who buys, I have nine godchildren. And what I do is I, whenever they have a birthday or a holiday, I buy them a gift and then I buy them stock in the company that makes that gift or that gift represents, right? Now I could do it in early bird. This made my life easier, <laughs> right? So like, this is already something I do. And this is something that I advocate for other people to do. Now I got a company I'm behind to support, make that happen. Like, hey, that's a win-win for everybody. So I'm really bullish on them and I'm excited. That's awesome. And when you think about how you make investments in these teams, can you talk about some of the traits and founders that particularly interest you? Every deal is its own individual thing, right? Mm -hmm. Everything, like, I don't have a framework that says I only invest in founders should look like this. Mm -hmm. My framework is I look for exceptional people, right? But what makes you exceptional could be different for every person, right? It could be you got a crazy go-to-market strategy. It could be you just got amazing amount of traction because you're solving a problem that you care so deeply about. I think you're weird, right? Like David Pickrell from a company called Par, they help gig workers, you know, better manage all the different platforms they use, find more work and figure out which routes make you the most money. This dude was working at a venture firm, but cared about this problem so much that he was doing like two to four hours every day of gig work himself. And then he like went to another state and hung out with a gig driver who was making like 30 or $40 an hour routinely and just mm -hmm. rode around with him for a week to figure out how he did it. <laughs> like it, it's going like all these like off the beat path, like chat rooms and blogs and, and all these different things just to talk to these drivers in this community. It's like, you care about this way too much for <laughs> the perfect person to solve this problem. Right. And that's amazing. But then, you know, on the flip side, you got, a founder like, I don't know, Sierra for the company Rebundle, making plant-based biodegradable braiding hair because she had such a bad experience putting synthetic hair in her head. She wanted to solve a problem for it. Like the idea of using plant to create hair that's safer on your body and better for the environment, that's just crazy. Like who thinks like that? That's, that's, that's awesome. And then Specifically in that company rebundle, what I, the reason I made that investment, cause they do have some competitors. One was they were the first ones to launch in the U S with the product, but two, they had a really strong brand. The founder Sierra spent time building her brand as an influencer in the sustainability space. And then was really thoughtful about all the branding she put together for her company. Right. And what we know is the best product's not always going to win a market, but if you got a strong brand and you can show that you keep customers coming back, then you might have a shot. And mm -hmm. so in that instance, it was a combination of an amazing founder with a truly amazing vision, building something unique that was hitting on some macro trends, right? of sustainability and, and wanting to have better products for people of color for their hair, while also having a strong brand that is really carrying the company. And so that was, you know, though all those pieces come together, that makes it an interesting one. But then, you know, we got a founder like Femi from Scholarly, which is being rebranded soon. You know, the reason I made the investment in him is because he's the one who famously used a Venmo hack to get his first 25,000 users. And like, I didn't need to know anything else. Like you figured out <laughs> how to send people money on, on Venmo with a message that drew them back to your platform because Venmo is a social media app. I never considered anything like, like that young man. And he was what, 17 when he told me he did this. Like I knew he was smarter than me and everybody else in the room. And she's like, yeah, just, just give him a check and we'll see what happens. And he goes on the YC, you know, he raised money from Paul Graham personally. He's getting ready that he just raised some significant capital is getting ready to raise more, you know, he'll have a company valued at over a hundred million here soon. He's a 21 year old black kid from Baltimore. Like that's incredible. Right. And all I, I needed to know, know was like, 
Yeah, I, did, I didn't know he was from Baltimore. I got introduced to him through Vern at Real Time and, and Marlon at Impulse. And they were like, yo, you have to meet Demi. He's awesome. And we missed the timing of the round, but I was just so blown away by, like, his his presence is one where you just, like, whatever he needs to do, he's going to figure it out. <laughs> you're like, you're good. Like, you got it. Whatever you need to learn, you're going to learn and be so excited by it. So when I worked for the state of Maryland, I wrote him his very first check. Really? I gave him 40K to drop out of college. Wow. Wow. What a, what a crazy journey. So yeah, I would love to hear more. When you were making investments for the state of Maryland, it was their first innovation fund that they stood up. Is that correct? No. So I stood up. So I worked with so the organization I worked for, Tedco, at the time had been around almost 20 years. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was originally founded because in the state of Maryland, we do really, we rank really high of research but we suck at commercializing that research. So they were originally created to help fund the commercialization of, of companies coming out of our research institutions. And over time it became more of a funding organization. So they get $21 million annually to deploy across nine different funding programs. They make Whoa. 60 to 80 seed deals and 20 pre-seed deals a year. Before YC, they were the most active seed investor and in it tells you like how long they've been around. And so when I got there, they had they specifically had a hard time of investing in black leg companies. Mm-hmm. And one of the issues that came up with these companies, a lot of these founders were complaining about the lack of access to friends and family capital to compete for our seed fund. And so I started a pre-seed fund to invest in black founders and then eventually underrepresented founders and women and women founders. And that was the first of its kind. So it was the first, and at the time, only state-backed pre-seed fund for women and minorities in the country. We launched that in 2017 and I ran that for three years and eventually we were able to get the state of Maryland to put a million dollars in the annual budget to make it a long-term fund here, which is something like I'm truly proud of. And so Femi's company, Scholar Me, was actually in the pilot year, the very first year we did it, where we made our first nine investments. And I think his company was the last investment of that group. And I met Femi when he was like 16 and in high school. And like <laughs> I, I was speaking at an event and he would just happen to be there. And then like, I would speak at like high school events around the city and like he was like every, every STEM high school after school thing he was at. And I was like, are you following me or am I following <laughs> you? I can't tell. And so it's just that. incredible to see like how far that comes. And like, it also validated like my thought process about investing in pre and going earlier. And granted, you know, it's taking them a while to get here, but like, that's not uncommon for companies. You know, YC talks about Companies going through, raising a bunch of money, then they're in the wilderness for two years before, you know, they come back on the scene and you see them like go crazy. So yeah, that was, that was like, though, those, that time working for the state of Maryland was super important for me as I've grown on this and invest. I love that. So speaking of heading into the wilderness, you've just come off a very long period of fundraising. How are you thinking of using or differently structuring your time as, as we're entering the wilderness part of being fund managers. Here's the, here's the thing, right? <laughs> like, I want to take a break. I want to focus on some things. I want to do some planning, but honestly, we're in a really crazy market. Things are moving really fast. Things are moving really high. And when you have momentum, you can't stop. And this is actually something Charles Essen told me, you know, he's like, you know, you don't stop. If you got the momentum, you keep going. So honestly, now that fun one's closed, we're actually spending Q4 working on the strategy and putting materials for fun two together. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to be back in the market raising fun two, <laughs> right? <laughs> like right afterwards, which I'm not excited about, but it is, I'm excited about the potential for a larger fund where I can really bring you know my team on and be able to pay them have them full time. So excited for that, but I'm going right back to the fundraising. <laughs> and, you know, it's also weird because, you know, for us, you know, I know you've gone through this page where a large portion of our fundraising has been done over COVID, mm-hmm. right? You know, we've been over Zoom, we've been over meetings, travel's picking up again. And now I'm like starting to feel the, 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 I'm starting to feel the weight of the travel and how much traveling it is, how many yep. different places I go to. Like I find myself in New York almost like twice a week right now. I'm just like, eh. 
I don't know if I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> it's such a crazy story. So for context, for those listening, Mac and I both participated in Joel with Sutton Capital's Emerging Fund Manager Program, which is awesome. I highly recommend. And he hosted a family office summit, which is the first time I met Mac in person. And Mac, I would love for you to share this story because I feel like it's such a great encapsulation of your dedication to venture. It's crazy. So like I set up, you know, my train ride, I was going to get there. Like Joel asked me to moderate a panel, like said, sure. And so I'm, I'm going to catch a train up, up to New York, but I, I've made it so that like I would get to New York and I have like a 45 minute buffer to get to the event. So I get, so I get on the train and the train is running 10 minutes late. We lost 10 minutes there. 45, <laughs> now 35. Cool. I get there and I call an Uber, but they want me to walk to a corner. I don't know New York. I have no clue where I am outside of like, I'm at Penn Station. So it's not going <laughs> to pick me up here. It's going to pick me up the corner. So I walk to one street. It's the wrong corner. I got to get to the other end of the street. I'm trying to talk to the Uber driver who's not being helpful. And as soon as I get to the corner where he's at, he pulls off. I'm like, awesome. Let me get a Lyft driver. Got a Lyft driver, picked me up. I'm now wasting another 16 minutes. So my 45 minutes is now down to 20. I should still be good. We got time to get there. The driver starts driving and every street he wants to go to is getting blocked off. Why? Because the UN is in town. So not only is there traffic and streets are blocked off, my driver didn't know how to get to where we need to get to. And I'm like, awesome. And I'm just watching time click away, tick away, tick <laughs> away. And so we get to the point where like, I'm clearly late and we're like three blocks away from where I need to be. And we're just like standstill traffic. And so I just jumped out of the lift, paid the guy and like ran to where the event was being held. I walk in in my nice dress clothes, which I hadn't worn all pandemic and like sweat pouring down. I opened the door to the room and as I opened the door to the room, Joel looks at me. He's like, Hey Mac, glad to see you here. Why don't you come up on stage and finish this? I'm just like, okay, give me a moment to catch my breath. Let's go. <laughs> so I was like 20 minutes late, but. Still had an amazing panel. Yeah. And I think it was so synchronous that you showed up as he got to the question where you were asking institutional LPs about the importance of investing in diverse fund managers, which was just that such perfect timing. You'd asked like a couple of questions before then you popped in and I thought it was like an unplanned entrance of yours. I didn't know that you were going to be moderating the whole panel. So I think that that was just such, such an incredible story and such a great way to get to finally meet each other in person. And like, as you think about building your team, I think this is like one of the things that I'm thinking about as we wrap up fund one is like, how do you scale this effort? So I'm curious, like how you're thinking about the structure of your team and, and how you're selecting people to work at Rarebreed. I'm being really lazy about it. So like to <laughs> date, I have two venture partners and three fellows, all the people I either knew before I started my fund or who like chase me down and like wouldn't leave me alone until I gave them work to do. Mm -hmm. And so like at this point, it's like, well, this team. And then there's a few associates at other firms who I've worked really closely with who have sourced deals from me. Like when I get a chance, I'm going to poach you. And so like, really, I had a structure for like a full, like six person staff already just like built in, which, you know, probably is lazy of me. Maybe I could do better to do like a full search, but I work with the team who believed in me when you know other people were. So we'll see how far that gets me. Yeah, that's really powerful. I think I'm starting to see that more and more is like why people make decisions like that. It's like as you're coming up, like that early belief is so important. And also like as you're building a venture firm, the commitments that you're making to hire people are often much longer term than other commitments. If you're at a startup or something like that, often fun cycles are you know, three to five years and you're expecting someone to stay on. So you want people that really truly believe in the mission and resonate with the values that you want to build a company with. Yeah. Wow. So, so crazy. What have you learned over this past year? What have, what have been the biggest things you've been reflecting on? One, that you can do venture differently. You don't have to follow anybody. Two, just do it. Like everybody, like when you want to do something that people think is crazy, you'll get a lot of naysayers, but just like, just go do it. Like, I don't even know if I could raise a $10 million fund. Like if you told me I could raise a $10 million fund in less than 18 months, I told you were crazy. 
I figured if you gave me 18 to 24 months, I might be able to get close. I could talk to enough people. I could figure out. But no, like, I had the ability to do it because I know what I'm doing. Like, I do this, right? I, like, this is what I do. I am a good investor. But it can be scary, right? Nobody's, like, if you're not at a big name firm and everybody already knows your name and people want to throw money at you, it's a really hard road and it can be really scary. And, and honestly, we don't talk about this, but most people who go out to raise funds don't, right? Most people don't hit their targets. But don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't, right? Don't ever let anybody tell you that you're not good enough, yourself included. Like, you can't tell you, you can't speak to yourself and tell yourself that you're not good enough. Because for a long time, that's what I was doing. And so I've learned to like stay away from that. I've also learned that don't let, don't let money stop you from doing it. Like if you don't have the money, just start doing it. Cause if you go about it right, there will be people around to help, you, you know, mm -hmm. famously for me, you know, I'm currently a Kaufman fellow, which is amazing. Kaufman, for those who don't know, is a fellowship program. It's like the premier VC fellowship program. It's like the Harvard VC, right? It's 80 grand for two years. And you got to pay that up front. Like if you get in, they give you like 60 days. Send them 80 grand <laughs> shit, which is astronomical and, and, and like insane. It's something I could never afford. Mm -hmm. But when I got accepted into the program, I wrote an email to a few of my LPs and one of them was a mentor and advisor of mine. So yeah, don't worry about it. I got this. He's like, you need this opportunity. You need to do this. Go do that. I couldn't thank him enough. And there are other people in my class who had similar situations and found other people and other organizations to support them through that. And like for the longest time, I wouldn't apply because I'm like, I can't afford it. Mm -hmm. But I have to say that now being in, it's one of the best things that's ever happened to me. It's one of the best group of people I've ever been able to work with. And I can be more thankful to that LP for, you know, giving me the opportunity to do this. But, and even like raising my fund, like I'm like, I don't have money for a GP to commit. Most of my LPs have been okay with that. <laughs> right? Like I've yeah. been told my whole life, like, oh, if you don't have a GP commit, you'll never like, no, that's not true. Right? Like just because I didn't have the money didn't mean I wasn't a good investor. So I just didn't let that stop me. So I learned that along the way. Just the power of community, like people are, people are fundamentally good. People want to be helpful. People want to support, you know, the amount of founders I've said no to, but who said good things about me on Twitter is like mind blowing to me. Like I far more expect them to cuss me out than I expect them to say thank you. <laughs> right. Even if I feel yeah. like I've been helpful. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's been cool to see how many people have been willing to help along in the process that everybody tells you is so hard and like so insular. Absolutely. I, yeah, I loved, I just recently today saw a thread about a founder who you met with and ended up turning down, but they went on to talk about how helpful you were in, in helping them pitch. I think that's a very common thing is like, if you haven't raised money for a startup before, or if you haven't raised like a significant amount of capital, it takes a long time to perfect the art of pitching. And I think as a venture capitalist, like you're seeing all of these founders come out to market and pitch and kind of like seeing what elements work. And then also as a fund manager, raising your own fund, you get intimately familiar with <laughs> what works and what doesn't in fundraising. So I commend you for sharing that information and helping that founder of their pitch. I, I think this topic of abundance is really interesting. I think that's something that you and I share is optimistic view of the world and a strong belief in the abundant, not letting money stop you. I have had similar feelings about Kaufman. I went to a state school, was very fortunate, got a scholarship and worked my way through. But that 80K price tag on the Kaufman program, I was like, so... Putting some feelers out in the universe for something to happen, hopefully. I Did you apply for class 27? No, I haven't. I've you been gotta apply for about class 27. It. Paige, you gotta apply. You gotta apply. Now okay. that we're here, I need you to apply to Kaufman. You're putting so, me on the spot. <laughs> yes. Like no but questions wanna, asked, just apply. We'll figure I, um, everything else out. I wanna hear more about your experience at the retreat because you posted a picture on Twitter at 1440 Multiversity, which is an incredible 
campus that was built by one of the founders of Jupiter Networks in hopes that folks would come to get more multidisciplinary education. And I went to a conference that really impacted the future of my life called Hive Global Leaders in 2019 there. So I'd love to hear more about your experience. There's an awesome picture of all the fellows of Kauffman that were Black, and I think that was such an incredibly powerful testament to the community. So I want to hear more about your experience there. Well, I'll say this, right? At Kauffman, you know, it's a VC training and fellowship, but really, first and foremost, they're all about helping you understand yourself so that you can be a better leader and a better investor, a better person first, and then a better investor second, right? So they spend a lot of time helping you understand yourself, the way you think, the way you perceive, the way people perceive you, to help you better understand the world around you, how to work and operate with the world around you, and how to be a better conduit in the world. And then we dig into all the VC stuff. So the thing about Kaufman, you know, if, as a VC, Everything we do is transactional. Most people look at this as checkbooks, right? <laughs> Everybody wants something from you, whether it's a deal or money. When you're in Kaufman, you're around people who have the same understanding of the world and what we do, but allow you to be in a place where you can be truly open, transparent, and vulnerable, right? Where you can share the most personal of things and have a group of folks to rally around you who you can also do transactional things with, right? <laughs> and like that is such an incredible thing. And so the, 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 the module we did at 1440 was the first time we'd ever gotten to meet each other in person. And we were there class 26 and class 25 at the same time and got to, to, to share notes, to, to spend time, to like fellowship together. You know, they made space for all the black fellows to hang out which is really amazing. It was, it was a really instructive time for me and, and I think for m most people there. And it was there that, again, somebody I truly respect and look up to talked to me and, and gave me some advice and gave me a push to think bigger and do bigger. And so I'm super excited for my fun too and what I'm going to do. But, you know, it's because of, the individuals there and the support that I get through my call from the network. I think that is, has been so instrumental in my journey as well. You shared that when you started, you would have never believed that you could have raised the amount of money that you did in the time that you did. And I sure as hell felt that way. And it was interesting. I don't know if you experienced this, but towards the end of our fundraise, people would be like, so why are you like only raising this amount of money? And I would just would laugh and think back to the time where I was like, oh, honestly, I thought this was impossible like six months ago. <laughs> so I'm still trying to come to terms with it. And I think the power of meeting and having intimate conversations with folks who have done more is like the same as seeing someone run the four minute mile. It's like you didn't think it was possible. And then you see people do it and you do it yourself and you're like, oh, wow, I really can think bigger. But, I, you know, looking back, it was almost impossible to comprehend doing what we have done. And I feel really grateful to be where we are. I'm curious who in your journey has been instrumental in giving you those pushes and what was the advice that they shared with you? Charles Hudson has been really instrumental and somebody I can go to for things. Marlon Nichols as well, for sure capital. Elizabeth Yen from Hustle Fund, who was one of the first GPs to commit money to my fund on our first call ever. And now she's like legitimately a good friend, oh, which is crazy. Like I met her on <laughs> Twitter, like, you know, she's a friend. Vlad, who helped launch Foot Locker's corporate venture arm, is now with Main Street Capital Partners. Vlad, you know, he's a black guy from New York who's a GP of a billion dollar fund. And, you know, he was, he's a Kaufman, you know, he's in my Kaufman class. And he's one of the guys who pulled me aside and told me, like, you know, you can do this. You know, he, he gave, he legitimately gave me a pep talk. And, like, <laughs> 8 o'clock at night, walking around 1440. And I can never thank him enough for that. But all the people I mentioned have been 
truly instrumental for me. And then also Vince Talbert, who was one of the co-founders of Build Me Later, a company that got acquired by PayPal for a billion dollars back in, you know, he's a, he's a Maryland guy. You know, he's been a, an advisor of mine since I was an entrepreneur. And, you know, to have him support and you know, always have my back and tell him, you know, to keep going, it's been great. And there's been tons of other folks. So if I didn't say your name, Sorry. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I I'm going to shout out one of my LPs, Zach Silverman. So Zach Silverman's incredible because he loves to tell the story that he literally had the ability to make an investment in one emerging fund manager. He had enough money to make one investment. He made it a rare breed. He did it through his parents because he, he wasn't considered accredited, but his parents are. And, you know, he got me to sit down with his parents and explain to everything who made the investment. And I can't tell you how supportive that man has been time and time and time again. Like he legitimately loves rare breed. Like he's probably, he might be our biggest supporter, <laughs> right? And, and granted, it's, he's not our biggest check, but he truly believes in what we're building. So like, even like, no matter how big our fund gets over time, he'll always have a spot. Right. No matter how big or small a check he wants to write, like he will always be a member of the rare breed family. So I'm really happy to have him. Myself. I love that. Well, Mac, our time today is coming to an end, but I always enjoy our conversations and this is no exception. Before we part ways, do you have any advice for folks that are looking to get into venture? My advice is network is key. However you build your network, you know, I use Twitter. You can use LinkedIn. You can go to events, whatever, but this is a network industry. Meet all the, try to reach out and meet all the folks you can reach out to me, reach out to page, reach out to emerging manager, reach out to experience manager. You'll be surprised how many people will take that meet. And when you do be very thoughtful in learning as much as you can and make sure you take down notes on what it is that they and their fund is interested in. Because not only should you be meeting fund managers, you should also be meeting companies, right? That way, as you find companies that you think are incredible, that fit the thesis of some of the fund managers you're meeting, start making introductions. You know, start building a name for yourself as somebody who has strong deal flow, because deal flow will get you hired. And if thought leadership is where you want to be, start writing. Whether it be a Substack, tweets, LinkedIn, blog post, I don't care. Start writing so people can understand your personal viewpoint on the world in some aspect of investing, whether it be the metaverse, whether it be NFTs, whether it be crypto or a fintech or consumer, or whatever it is. Let people know that you have a point of view. That'll serve you well. Those are two tangible things I could put up. I love that. Well, thank you so much for your time, that guy. So appreciate it. I had so much fun today. Me too, Paige. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for tuning in today to Seed to Harvest. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe wherever your favorite podcast listening platform is. I'll be releasing new episodes weekly. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know on Twitter. That's Paige Finn, Paige and then Finn with three N's. Thanks and see you again next week.